Hey everyone, Khalid here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. In today's video, we're going to be breaking down for you the Stanmore Triangle of Shoulder Instability. This is a great classification we can use, and this is the classification in its full. We're going to now break down each of the individual components to help you understand it. So the first thing to mention with the fact that it's a triangle is that there's three different types of shoulder instability. And as you will see, patients can have more than one characteristic of each individual type. So there are three key types. The first type is polar type one, traumatic structural instability. So these are gonna be your patients who have had a clear trauma that has led to their shoulder instability. And the thought process being with these patients is that because they've had a trauma, that trauma itself has caused structural changes to the shoulder. And those ongoing structural changes are going to cause further instability. So classic examples of structural changes that can happen from a trauma might include a Bankart lesion. This is where we have the soft tissue on the antero-inferior aspect of the glenoid getting ripped or torn, meaning that there is less of a bumper on the front of the shoulder to prevent the humerus from sliding too far forwards. Therefore, if it's not there, it's going to lead to potentially increased anterior instability. You can also have a bony Bankart lesion. This is where the bone, as well as the soft tissue labrum in that antero-inferior aspect of the glenoid gets fractured. And therefore, again, the shoulder loses its anterior bumper, meaning that there's less resistance preventing the humeral head from sliding too far forwards. Another one you may have heard of is a hill sax lesion. This is where, as a result of the trauma, a small fragment of bone on the posterior humerus gets fractured off or compressed, and therefore it means that the humeral head is not completely round in its shape because it's got this lost area of bone. Once again, this means that when the shoulder's moving, there's less of a restraint to stopping the shoulder getting stuck in place or dislocating and then not being able to relocate in position. So for all these reasons, these patients have had structural changes following an initial trauma, and that is really important to highlight. So the idea, therefore, is that patients may unfortunately try physiotherapy and hopefully some of them get better with physiotherapy. But if you're finding that these patients aren't improving, it could well be because of the fact that those structural changes, the Bankart lesion or the Hillsax lesion, because those aren't being fixed, it means that the shoulder is vulnerable to further instability. And therefore, one of the key management strategies for traumatic structural instability is surgery, to repair that Bankart lesion or to repair that Hillsax lesion in order to reverse those structural changes to hopefully reduce the possibility of the shoulder redislocating. So that's polar type one. Next, let's talk about polar type to your atraumatic instability group. So as the name would suggest, these patients have not necessarily had a trauma that has set off their symptoms. Instead, these patients may have a shoulder which is either born loose or worn loose. This is a really good description created by Andrew Jaggi, who's a shoulder instability specialist. And you can think of these patients who have long-term changes to the shoulder that have not been caused by an initial trauma. So born loose, these patients may have hypermobility. They may have connective tissue disorders like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. That means that there is an inherent laxity to the ligaments and soft tissue around the shoulder, meaning that they may dislocate because of the fact that that soft tissue is more lax and is less adept at preventing the shoulder from dislocating. So that might be your born loose group. Your worn loose group might be those who, when they were born, had no problems with their shoulder, but over time have developed a laxity through their work, their hobbies, or their sport. The natural example to paint here is your baseball pictures. You will see your baseball pictures getting to extreme positions of shoulder external rotation when they're throwing a baseball. Now, 
that ability to move their shoulder that far will have been developed over time with the amount of baseball pitches they've thrown. But therefore, over time, their shoulder has become gradually more loose or more lax. It's been worn loose from that repeated positioning of the shoulder as such. And therefore, over time, they will develop an acquired laxity to their shoulder because of the fact that the soft tissue has got more loose and more lax over time in line with their work, hobbies or sports. So therefore, these patients will have structural changes, but they will have been developed over time rather than the type 1 group who have structural changes via a trauma. So how do this group present in terms of when their dislocations occur? Well, we tend to find that rather than having a high level trauma that causes their instability, like polar type 1, these patients tend to have more low level mechanisms of injury that may dislocate their shoulder because they have that inherent laxity. So, for example, trying to put on their seatbelt and reaching into that position or shutting a heavy door, something that for you and I would be quite typical, but for them may cause a feeling of instability or even a dislocation. And you may find with these individuals that they can quite easily pop their shoulder back in because it's a relatively low level mechanism of injury that's caused it and therefore it's relatively easy to put back in. Sometimes you'll see sporting athletes who are able to just pop their shoulder back in and there won't have been a major trauma that caused them to do it but it just popped out so they just popped it back in. Those are the kind of presentations you might see with these patients where their mechanism of injury that causes a feeling of instability is quite low. So that would be your polar type 2, your atraumatic group. So that's type 1 and type 2. Finally, let's talk about polar type 3. And these are your muscle patterning, non-structural patients. So as the name suggests, these patients do not necessarily have a structural cause to their instability. They haven't had a trauma that's led to a Hillsax lesion or a Bankart lesion like type 1. And they don't have this generated acquired laxity over time like the type 2 patients. Instead, it is abnormal muscle patterning that leads to these patients feeling unstable. This tends to be larger muscle groups like your latissimus dorsi, your pectoral muscles, your deltoid muscles, which have developed this habit over time or this recruitment pattern over time, which works in an abnormal way that when those muscles move, because of the increased tone in those muscles, it can pull the humerus out of joint. And this tends to happen in very non-threatening positions, like when a patient is lying down, when their arm is in a position of less than 45 degrees, something which shouldn't cause instability, but because the muscles have been developed in this way and have generated this recruitment pattern in this way, it can cause the shoulder to sublux. One typical story you may see with these patients is that they can pop their shoulder in and out almost on demand. This may have started as a party trick that they would say to their friends, oh, look how cool I am. I can pop my shoulder in and out. But then it becomes habitual. And therefore, by becoming habitual, when those muscles get recruited, it causes the shoulder to sublux. So once again, the key feature here is that these patients do not have a structural change or a structural cause to their symptoms. Instead, it's the muscle patterning that has an effect on their symptoms. You may well find that these patients have a large psychological component to their instability. And that would make sense given the fact that it kind of pops in and out so often. And therefore, don't be surprised if there's a biopsychosocial element to their instability as well. So those are the three different types. Now, you may have noticed a few arrows on the classification that we showed you at the beginning. And let's talk through those now. So the thought process being is that the first arrow that we can see running straight down the middle of the triangle highlights that as patients have more characteristics of type 2 and type 3, there is less trauma involved in their instability. That would make sense. The polar type 1 of the group who have major trauma that starts off their symptoms. And therefore, you'll find the closer you get to types 2 and 3, there's less trauma involved. Conversely, you'll find the second arrow. That the more we get away from type 3, the less 
Muscle patterning is a feature of these patient symptoms. So with your type 1s and your type 2s, there's less of a drive from the muscle patterning that causes their instability. Now, all of this is really important. Why do we classify patients in this way? Well, number one, for our assessment and diagnosis, but number two, crucially, for management. Now, as we said, with your polar type 1 patients, if they're not responding well to physiotherapy and if there has been identified as a structural cause on x-rays or MRI scans, then these patients are more amenable to surgery to fix that structural change and therefore hopefully reduce instability in the shoulder because the structural change has been fixed. With your type 2 and type 3 patients, surgery is less of a viable option and that's because the structural changes in the type 2 group are less amenable to surgery because they're generally due to capsular laxity and that isn't always something that we can easily prevent. You can do tightening procedures but again these patients may not always respond well to this and therefore it means that physiotherapy is more utilized for this group. With your type 3 patients as we said there is no structural cause for their symptoms and therefore surgery should not be performed for these patients because there's no structural cause that can be repaired surgically. What you may find with these patients is if they do have surgery, very quickly after their surgery, their muscles go back to that nor to what they consider to be a normal recruitment pattern and cause the shoulder to dislocate. And therefore, once again, as well as our assessment and diagnosis, the main reason for classifying our patients into these different types is to try and inform our management. And I hope the explanation gives you a reason as to why. So everyone, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please support us by smashing that like button is the number one thing you can do to help our YouTube channel. And if you want more resources from us, please do check out our Instagram account, at Clinical Physio. Give us a follow there for brilliant resources for physiotherapists. And don't forget, we also have our membership platform. Link in the description below, member.clinicalphysio.com. On membership, we've got loads of brilliant premium resources for growing physiotherapists, including our shoulder differential diagnosis webinar, our shoulder objective assessment webinar, and loads of other brilliant resources to help you with your shoulder pain patients. My name's Khalid. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.